So I'm going to throw a lid for this cover jar here. And because I marked in the slip on the bat the size of this rim, I can reference that for the size of this. And it's 11.8 centimeters. So I will throw this lid to that size. When I get to about this stage of centering, I want to uh, get out the ruler and measure the calipers out to the size that I'm going for. So we're at 11.8. And I set the calipers a little bit smaller than that. I want the lid to be smaller than the rim on that is wide. And that way I can trim it to the right size to where I have a nice snug fit. So just reference that really quick to see where I'm at. And this, this lid is being thrown upside down at this point, like a bowl. And so it wasn't quite wide enough. I widen it out. And so the rim of that jar is going to rest right inside of this ridge here. So that's what I'm using to measure by. And it's always good to have it a little bit smaller. If you make it too big and try to bring it back in, sometimes as it's drying or firing, the memory in the clay is such that it can actually open back up to where it was when it was too big and you'll have a looser fitting lid. So what I'm thinking about at this point, when this lid is on the jar, um, actually this part right here is visually going to register as the rim of the pot. And so I'm already starting to consider that in the shaping of the outer section there. So now that I'm pretty close to the right size, I'm going to take all of the extra kind of wet clay out of the inside of the lid, but at the same time, I'll clean that off. At the same time, I'm actually going to leave a texture on the inside surface here by getting the wheel going fairly slowly and bouncing that rib and then easing off right there at the end. And I like to, to leave that kind of distinct mark. It, it kind of is a little bit of evidence of what was happening when the piece was made. And now I kind of do a finishing point on the inside here as well kind of ties it all together. And so now I'm going to measure the width of this and I did make it a bit too wide. So I will bring it in a bit here. And that's closer to where it needs to be. So, okay, this is dried up enough to be able to trim. So I'll stick it to the wheel head, get a sense for how thick it is and see where I need to trim the most off. See how thin it is in the middle, so I know that I can still take a fair bit off there without trimming through. Now that I've trimmed this lid as thin as I want to go with it, and um, it, it's about the right shape for what I'm looking for, I will do a final smoothing to get this area ready for carving. Then I'll let this dry a bit and come back and throw a knob on the top. Okay, so now that this has had a chance to dry a bit, I'll be um, throwing a knob separately off of the hump and attaching it and shaping it on the top of this lid for the large jar. And for smaller pieces like this, I'll just throw it off of a small hump of clay. It's easier to deal with than trying to throw from one tiny little piece. And so this is being thrown upside down at this point. So imagining this is going to be the section that gets attached to the lid. So I leave extra clay up here and a little bit of a bevel to match the angle of the top of the lid there. And this extra clay on the outside will become kind of a step up from the edge of the lid 
to that knob, kind of an intermediate point there. Let's just use a nail with some thread hanging off of it is a good way to get a piece off of the hump and let that wrap all the way around and give it a quick pull and it comes right off. Now I'll attach the lid for the tall jar to the wheel head um, to get ready to attach the knob handle on the top there. Now I mark out the approximate width of the clay that I've already thrown for the knob there. And I'll try to kind of tap that to center and then I can get a more accurate measurement on where I need to score and slip to attach that. And I always score and slip the clay for the knob first. If I, in the past, I would have done maybe the lid first. And what happens sometimes is that gets too soft, especially if I've trimmed it really thin. And so um, by scoring and slipping that second, it gives it uh, less time to get too soft and soggy. And so I'll, I'll do this first and just uh, make sure I don't use too much water because I'm gonna be throwing this right after I attach it. I don't want it to be sliding around too much. And so that gets attached. And the nice thing about that extra bit of clay that I left on the outside there is it gives me a little bit of space to push this down and really get a strong connection. And I'm sealing it on the inside and out. And so with a good strong seal, now I can go in there and start to throw. And I'll throw most of the wobble that's in there out, get it back on center. I can get rid of a lot of this extra clay. I always use quite a bit of clay at first, knowing that I can always just cut that extra clay away. And so now with the rib, I'll start shaping some of that in. And I leave it tall enough so that I can collar that knob in, have enough clay to be able to collar it in. And so for collaring, it's the two index fingers, the tips of my thumbs, and the tips of these middle finger knuckles. And so I'm really giving even pressure from these six points. And as it gets closer together, sometimes I'll actually cut a bit of that clay off that becomes uneven. And that's just due to a little bit of unevenness in, uh, in the thickness of the wall there. So I'll close that in. And then with the air trapped inside, I really have an opportunity to do a little bit of kind of aggressive shaping with this without having to worry too much about it collapsing. That that air really helps out. And I like to lay this clay down a little bit onto that surface below. I like the idea of showing, you know, that as this was attached, there was a difference between the two surfaces. So to kind of highlight the softness of the clay on this lower portion at this point, sometimes I'll get the wheel spinning fairly slowly, lay the rib down on that soft clay and just start to bounce it. And with the glaze on that, you know, it, it shows the softness of the clay, but it also, um, it also is a way to kind of mirror what's happening with the carving on the side of the jar where, you know, the lower areas pool more glaze, the higher raised areas, um, the glaze breaks a bit thinner and you get to see that variation there. One consideration to make on the inside of the lid, just practically speaking, there needs to be somewhere for the air that's trapped inside of the knob there to escape. And so there was a point when I started uh, doing hollow thrown handles where it would have just been poke that needle through tool through there <clears throat> and have that just be a functional escape for the air. Um, but really, in um, an effort to make every single part considered aesthetically, I started to think, okay, how can I make that air hole be an aesthetic choice as well? And so 
I started to, uh, to play around with that and came up with this pattern here. And it's, it's going to reference the decoration on the outside of the jar in that it's broken down into five equal segments. Um, but somehow, it's not a, a direct quote, but somehow it's something to do with the fullness of these jars. Um, references fertility, and so I'm kind of making a little bit more of a literal reference for that on the inside of the jar. I like that idea of surprise element too, when you open the jar and see that. 